Sometimes you got to give credit for trying, but it doesn't mean it was effective. So I'll tell you a really funny story of my pre-freshman year. So we have something called new student orientation. This is something I don't know if University of Pennsylvania still has this, but when I went to college, we had new student orientation, which is the freshmen go a week or two before and they just kind of get to know each other. The school tries hard to get you integrated into the system and then tries to help you make friends. Now, one of the things that University of Pennsylvania tried to do during the summer was it was trying to get the whole school on the same page by making us read a book. Now, I'm going to put on my scholar glasses for this because this was quite an interesting attempt at building community. So for those of you who've never read this book, this is a book by author Neil Shubin about how we finally found that missing link in the evolutionary fossil record between the fish that would kind of go on land and come back and the fish that finally eventually could just stay on land. That's basically what this book's about. Now, I'm simplifying it a lot. He goes through a lot of great things, basically explaining how a lot of our genetic code still has remnants of our ancestors, obviously. So, first of all, think about it like this. If I am someone that goes to University of Pennsylvania, there's a high likelihood I'm not even going to be interested in this stuff. Why? Because University of Pennsylvania, so free college introduction, by the way, for any of you interested in the school I went to, they have a really good nursing program. They got a very, very good engineering program and they have Wharton Business School, as you guys know. So a lot of people are going there not to really learn about life, which was probably what college started out as, right? But it's kind of morphed because Obviously, the world changed and college is a big financial and time commitment. So somewhere along the line, college became more of let's go there to build some skills. And University of Pennsylvania is really much about this. In fact, out of all the Ivy Leagues, it's definitely the most about this. So the people that are in the nursing program might find this interesting, but they might find this too theoretical. The people in the engineering program, maybe the bio engineers might find this interesting, but the other engineers are like, why does this matter? Unless they just naturally have a curiosity, which, you know, there are some people like that. The business school people definitely will probably not care about this unless, again, they have a natural curiosity, which there's probably a 1% of the school that would do that, right? My point in saying this is that this was the wrong book to get every single person in the freshman year to try to read. A common complaint was this book was a little too deep. It was a little too scientific, yada, yada. I love this book, right? Because obviously the way I approached education for many years, I just wanted to learn everything. I still want to learn everything. That's why this channel has this broad appeal that a lot of channels don't. And it's why this channel for a long time, and it still can't really find its brand because I'm what some of you called a polymath. It's a word I learned from you guys. I just like to learn about stuff. So I found this book interesting. But a very common complaint was that, why are we reading this book? This has nothing to do with my major. This has nothing to do with what I want to do. Even the people in the general college, so not in the three specific pre-professional programs at University of Pennsylvania, a lot of them don't want to study the science, right? Some of them want to study economics. Some of them want to study creative writing. They don't want to learn about some little thing in evolution that's very important for humankind's knowledge, but some people just don't care. So I think a lot of us, just because we were the overachievers in high school, we all read this book. So then it's like, what do you do now that the entire community has read this book or 80 to 90% of the community has read this book? So first of all, the author of this book came and gave a talk, which was really cool. The entire school freshman class went into one of the big auditoriums, the big indoor stadiums, and kind of just listened to him talk. And then after it, to try to get every residential hall to bond a little. So for those of you who don't know what a residential hall is, if you stay on campus in the United States, you have a little group of people that are being led by an older student so that's a way to try to build community. So when I say residential hall, 
that's what I mean. So when I was a freshman, I stayed in the quadrangle. The quadrangle is usually associated with traditional colleges as the spot where students stay. Now, most colleges have ballooned up in population, so they have many other dorms. But usually the traditional place that students stay when they're an undergrad is the quadrangle. So I stayed in the quadrangle, and my college house was called Fisher Hassenfeld. For those of you who've gone to UPenn, whether to visit or you studied at UPenn, let me know if Fisher Hassenfeld is still there or has some other person given more money and donated enough that now the Fisher Hassenfeld is called something else. <laughs> right, that happens. So our residential hall, led by our residential assistant, an older student named Gene, we had to all get together with some random professor and discuss the book. It's ridiculous. Now, I say ridiculous because the execution was ridiculous. I think the intention was good, right? You want to establish that, hey, this is a place of discussion. Our school, no matter what you study, we should be able to talk about things. So the professor that we got together with to discuss this book was some social science professor. So he didn't have any knowledge of hard sciences. And we didn't even discuss this book for my memory. We sat in a classroom. Most of my hall was there. There was one guy. He was a legacy or something. Or he got extra knowledge that a lot of us first timers didn't have. Which was that you don't need to attend any of these events. So he just went and hung out with some frat that he wanted to be in. So he, we called him a DB back in the day. For those of you who don't know what DB is, it's a word that I want to use on YouTube. But I realize now he was actually the smartest one. He didn't waste his time at all. He just had fun that first week, basically. He didn't hang out with the hall or anything. Anyways, so the rest of the hall with our RA, our residential advisor, we hung out for like two hours with this professor who had no knowledge of social science. Because again, if you want every student group, so let's say a group of 20, to have a discussion with a professor, you're going to run out of professors knowledgeable in this area, right? So you're going to have to pull any professor that wants to have a discussion. And most people in academia want to have a discussion, even if they don't know anything, right? If they don't know anything, they don't care. They still want to talk. So this professor in the social sciences, somehow my RA, our hall's RA, got into a debate with him about something social science related. So for half an hour, the rest of our hall just kind of sat there wondering what the heck was going on while the RA and the professor got into some debate about social science. And the funny thing was, I studied a little bit about their debate. So eventually, after like 10 or 15 minutes, I was the only one that spoke up in support of my RA because I wanted the discussion to move to this. And I don't remember what I said, but I just remember I spoke up in her favor. And I was also, being the person I was trying to be, I still am, I saw his points. So I was sort of supporting him, but mostly supporting her, right? Because that's where the debate is. They couldn't see eye to eye, but actually there was a common ground they could have found. So it didn't help. It doesn't matter. The professor didn't care. He didn't really acknowledge my point. They still kept discussing and discussing and discussing and discussing. Eventually, after this whole two-hour shenanigans, the RA actually thanked me. She's like, oh, I thank you for backing me up. I could tell you studied this stuff too. I was like, yeah, I mean, we weren't even talking about what we we're supposed to talk about. So after the half an hour of a debate on some social science topic, I think eventually we did start talking about this. But again, it was just superficial talk because most of my classmates, from my understanding, weren't studying this stuff. And I was sort of interested in this stuff. And then the professor had no knowledge of this stuff. So it was a very failed discussion. And I remember you're making friends with a lot of people that first month. And then, of course, <laughs> nobody makes friends anymore, right? That's a common thing whenever there's a new environment. But I talked to people in other halls. I'm like, how was your discussion? They're like, oh, it was bad. <laughs> it was bad. Because, again, professors with maybe an interest in this stuff, but again, they don't have any knowledge in this stuff. And 
they're supposed to co-lead a discussion with a bunch of students who are very smart. And so every single student from another hall that I talked to, when I asked them about this discussion, they're like, yeah, it was complete BS, man. We didn't really talk about or learn anything. It was a waste of time. <laughs> so I talk about this because, first of all, I forgot that this even occurred. I found this book in my bookshelf. I'm like, first of all, it's been so many years since I've read this that I think I need to give other people a chance to read this, man. It shouldn't be sitting on my shelf, right? Knowledge should be spread. But it also made me remember this hilarious event from the beginning of college and how it was sort of a precursor or what's the word I'm looking for? The word is not in my mind right now, but it was a preview. That's the word. It's a preview of what academia, the whole college experience was going to be about. Very few people really want to learn about a lot of things. I don't blame them because the brain needs a break. Sometimes it doesn't want to keep thinking. And life is also not easy. So sometimes you just want to find something and just grasp onto it and live, right? So I get it. But for some people, including a lot of you that follow my channel, who really love knowledge, it's frustrating, especially if you go to an institution that you think you really will gain a lot of knowledge. And then you realize, wow, people don't come here for knowledge. So... Yeah, that was something I should have, if I were to talk to myself now, going back, I should have been like, hey, Jerry, you see this discussion or lack of discussion or failed discussion that the whole hall is having with this professor? That's basically going to be your experience in academia. It's going to be your experience these next four years. So think about this and plan accordingly. But again, I'm the first generation to go to college in America. So it's not like anybody could have given me any kind of warning. And even the people who grew up in America, who are generations in America, the college system has changed so much since their parent generation or their grandparent generation went to college. And so nobody could have prepared you for how much of a travesty our higher education's become. And granted, guys, I know some of you probably got a lot more out of college than some other people, and that's fine. So you're the exception. Just know that you're the exceptions. You're not the rule. So remember to have empathy on that because we aren't calling it a higher education bubble for no reason, right? And so thank goodness I got a lot out of college, but I had to really navigate. I had to really navigate and really do my own thing. But for people that went there with a specific view in mind, most of them had it shattered and there were definitely moments of sorrow and depression in a lot of higher education people. But I'll start it with this, man. This was the premonition. This was the preview. So anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this talk. As we know in life, community is important, right? And how you form community in this day and age is even more important. When I went to Canada to visit one of my parents' family friends, they had a son who was in high school. And he told me that he's been using a laptop for school since second or third grade. I forgot, but very young. I didn't start using a laptop until college, until University of Pennsylvania. So being of the digital age, digital generation, he knows how to build community in a way that People like me are still learning. His whole entire school uses Discord. Something I never thought could be possible. Remember this channel? I tried to create a Discord server for everyone. And I just got so frustrated. I'm like, what's the point of this, right? But they have integrated very well with these platforms that even people like me still have trouble. I'm telling you all this because community will always be important. And we have to adapt how we create and stay and thrive in communities as AI and everything keeps evolving. So I definitely have more thoughts on this, but this was not the right way to build community. <laughs> okay, guys, and also shout out Matthew. I'm gonna send this talk to Matthew because he inspired me a lot, man. Give me a lot to think about. The one thing, if you guys wanna have a takeaway as to what you can do in these next, let's say, 
15, 20 years, I would say talk a lot to Gen Z. And as Gen Alpha gets older, talk a lot to them, man. It's so underrated. Very, very underrated how much you can learn from younger people. Matthew's mom was like, Jerry, man, um, teach Matthew stuff. And told Matthew the same thing. Matthew, man, learn from Jerry. And I told his mom, I said, I actually am going to learn so much from Matthew. I told her that. Same thing with some of my very younger family friends that they were, let's say, little kids or babies when I was a teen. So they would be Gen Z, right? But you can almost call them like older Gen Z now. I love talking to them because I learned so much from them. How they use AI, how they use electronics, how they kind of adapt in this day and age where everything's on the phone, everything's on tablets, everything's on laptops. Eventually, we're going to have glasses and other things that will integrate us more with augmented stuff. So I never thought I would tie that into this, but talk a lot to young people, man. You'll learn a lot. There's this tendency, especially in my culture, to talk down to young people. And that's one thing that I've never, ever done. I've always loved to learn from young people. So I encourage all of you guys, learn from young people.